That'll be that with air horns. That'll be perfect. This time around, we're doing episode 1101, Reptilicus. But first, we have some follow-up. Yes, your testicle news now. (laughs) We have from Andrew in Newfoundland. Uh, Previously, you may recall from our last episode, we were discussing goat testicle enthusiast John Romulus Brinkley. And Andrew sent in an email uh, to let us know and recommend an episode of a podcast called The Dollop that goes into great detail about Romulus, which we'll have a link to in our show notes. And and we have actually a quite big announcement uh, in celebration of our 10th show. We are launching a Patreon page. We love doing this show, but it is a surprising amount of work. So in order to justify to both ourselves and our loved ones the amount of time and effort that we're putting into this podcast, we're asking our listeners out there to give us a little bit of help. So if you're enjoying the show, or if you think we're contributing something worthwhile to the MST3K fan community, please help us to keep building. And maybe with your help, we'll finish our goal of completing an entire compendium for the show. And you know what? You can support us and this podcast for literally only the cost of a cup of coffee. $1 $1 per episode, and you get access immediately to some bonus content. So if you're interested in supporting us, you can get to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash it's just a show. And for people who want to pledge at the $5,000 level, that will help us in our major goal of getting a studio that's made of solid gold. All right. Reptilicus. The movie begins with a bunch of Danish miners drilling in the Laplands, but as hunky blonde engineer Sven discovers, they haven't hit oil, or copper in this case, but blood and guts. They soon realize they have some kind of frozen prehistoric creature on their hands, and the tail section is flown to the Danish aquarium in Copenhagen to preserve the sample in cold storage. One scientist accidentally leaves the door open, however, which causes the tail to thaw. But it turns out it's okay, because the tail is alive and regenerating. Professor Otto Martins, who is the head scientist of the aquarium, is overjoyed and puts together a press conference where the creature is given its name, Reptilicus. Eventually, the inevitable happens, and the creature escapes smashing buildings, spitting green acid, and eating Danish farmers that look like they were pulled from an AHA music video. Obviously, the Danes can't handle this crisis on their own, so they call in the Americans. Brigadier General Grayson takes control of the military operation, even though he's initially resentful at being put in charge of such a backwater country. But he quickly befriends Sven, who's also been hanging around the aquarium for some reason. Oh, and there's some women too. Professor Otto's two daughters, Karen and Lisa, who mostly stand around looking shocked, and Connie Miller, another American, who informs the general that simply blowing up the creature would be a very bad idea. Whoops! It turns out they've already been doing that, using depth charges to get at the creature when it fled into the ocean to heal itself. Because of its regenerative properties, even a small piece of the creature could grow into a fully formed reptilicus. Their final solution? Render the monster unconscious using a sedative, which also kills it apparently. We leave the movie on an or is it button, as the final shot shows reptilicus's foot at the bottom of the ocean, twitching with life. And that's what happened in Reptilicus, but this is what happened in the host segments. Move over, Robert Townsend. There's a new meteor man in town. We're introduced to natural-born gizmocrat Jonah Heston in the show's cold open as he's hauling a shipment of meteors in a dinky yellow freighter. So move over, Stuart Gordon space truckers. There's a new... Wait, I already did that. Anywho, Will Wheaton and Aaron Gray, two employees from Gizmonic Institute's C-list celebrity cameo division, fawn over Jonah from a super marionation world that Jerry and Sylvia Anderson could only dream of. The Jonah love fest is interrupted when his freighter receives a distress call from Moon 13. Don't go, Jonah! To paraphrase a famous space fish from a Star War, it's a ruse! Gizmonic Institute loses contact with Jonah when his starbug is sucked into Moon 13. The premise for the show is set up by a fabulous new version of the MST3K theme song. So that lengthy cold open slowly introducing Jonah and, by extension, new viewers to the world of the show? Forget it! 
Segment one picks up two months later with Jonah acclimatized to his robot friends and the satellite he now calls home. He's even tweaked Gypsy's voice. Without prompting, we have the first invention exchange since season five. Jonah invents a fan that makes bubbles, but the man's got nothing. In segment two, Jonah displays his knowledge of cryptids worldwide in the form of a rap. Crow clones multiple servos with increasingly weird results in segment three. The original servo is destroyed when Crow tries to unmake them. A clone with free will is the sole survivor of Crow's maximum clonage, so he replaces the original Scarlet Servo forever. The fan letter segment returns for the first time since Season 7 in Segment 4. As only a program of ill repute would stack the deck with letters from friends and family for its first letter segment, uh, let's assume these letters went unanswered during the Sci-Fi Channel seasons. One viewer posits that there are two satellites of love, each with its own version of the show's bots, foreshadowing the appearance of Matt Claude Van Damme in a later episode, but let's not jump ahead. The Mads marvel at the camaraderie between Jonah and the bots in the final segment. Kinga's henchmen load the recording of this experiment in a container with 13 more empty slots waiting to be filled. Ominous. Now, uh, Beth, you noticed that uh, when the, uh, the, the, the farmers and such got eaten, that, uh, that they, they looked like uh, refugees from an AHA video? Did you, uh, did you notice that right away, or did it take you a day or two? <laughs> but hey, speaking of uh, a brand new era here, like, how do you find a Season 11, Episode 1 for like, an intro to Mystery Science for like, viewers new and old alike? Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. On the one hand, I think it makes total sense that they went with like a kaiju movie, you know, something big and monstrous. That's basically their jam. So on the one hand, it it seemed like a good choice. But on on the other hand, this wasn't the strongest start. And you can definitely feel like Joan and the bots are still getting their footing. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of commenters talk about this, but I found the pace to be really frenetic. And I was wondering if that might be just the case that there's a whole bunch of new writers in one place and they haven't really gelled as a group yet. So you're just getting a lot of ideas that work in isolation, but together it's... often feels like a too many cooks situation yeah and not like the hilarious adult swim show too many cooks but something really unpleasant (laughs) there's definitely some uh growing pains going on in this episode but i laughed a lot there was a lot about this that i i really enjoyed um in fact i think one of my favorite moments was um and we'll talk about this in a little bit about how we feel about jonah as a host but i will say this for him he does an amazing frank nelson impression (laughs) And there's this one character who looks a lot like Frank Nelson. So every time he showed up, Jonah would go, yes. And it made me laugh every time. Ah, Frank Frank Nelson. I'm glad that that reference still gets play in 2017. I'm glad that still works and people know who that is. They may not anymore. It's just become a, a thing detached from its original in a lot of ways. But it still makes people laugh. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I... I for the most part been pretty positive about the new cast and i especially think like the standout is uh, baron vaughn as servo because in the very very first segment uh he made me laugh with something that wasn't even a joke he uh uh, he he just turns to uh, jonah is like can i get you something to drink maybe something creamy and he just says that in a way that like it's like oh that's exactly what the character would say and how he would say it like he sounds a little bit like sleazy he sounds a little bit like a game show host mm-hmm. and i kind of like that i i i like what he's been doing with uh, with servo yeah we should mention that actually like when they're watching the movie the personalities flatten out but in the host segments the puppeteers are really picking up on the the personalities of the bots that have already been established. Crow is a bit of a scamp, and Tom Servo is a bit of a sleaze. Yeah, I kind of like that. Like, you know, Tom, I guess the note for Tom from the very beginning is Tom is someone who likes the sound of his own voice, and that line, like, that line made me laugh. And uh, there's also a really good goof at the very beginning in that same host segment at the beginning where he goes, uh, I can fly, but only in the theater. <laughs> So what did you think of Jonah as the new host? Well, uh, as I mentioned, it was either episode four or five where we were talking about our first impressions. I was relieved because I was a little hesitant about Jonah as a choice Mm -hmm. because I wasn't a fan of him as a podcaster or a stand-up. And I think he's fine and I think he's good in the theater. But what I would throw out and, 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 and... I almost feel bad saying this because his online presence is super nice. He's been really good with fans. But I I do find him a bit bland. Even after, like, 14 episodes, I've seen all of the season now. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure what to like make of Jonah. I, I don't really have a personality for him other than affable guy. I totally agree. He hits all his notes perfectly. He's very dexterous with the material. He keeps up. Like he he he's really good in the, the position, but. Uh, there's really no sense of his personality besides being kind of affably pleasant. And that's really striking when the initial sequence is trying so hard to establish a personality. Like, they're they're not showing us, they're telling us he's a rebel, he's a tinkerer, he's all these things. He he jams with his, his drum set, but they, they do all this establishing work and none of that pays off in any way that I can see, at least in the first two episodes. Yeah, I remember finding it super disorienting that you get this, you know, very unusual for the show origin story, I guess. You get uh, you, you get Jonah being lured into uh, Deep 13, or Moon 13, sorry, and, uh, you know, becoming the host and everything. And it's the only part of the episode that's not done in the talk directly to camera, public access style that, you know, the show is known for. And I was initially kind of interested because I thought maybe they were going to shoot the episodes and this whole season uh, the way they shot MST3K the movie where they they don't break the fourth wall and they take advantage of widescreen. So instead of having, you know, people framed talking directly to the camera, you're seeing them communicate with view screens like they did with Dr. Forrester and MST3K the movie. And it's not necessarily cutting back from set to set the way they did in the old show. Mm -hmm. But we get that cinematic opener which features two extremely distracting cameos. Oh my god. Can we talk about that? Yes. This begins season 11's love affair with unimportant distracting (laughs) cameos from people not associated with the show. You know, I like Will Wheaton. I don't know much about Aaron Gray, but they seem like perfectly pleasant people. But what they're asked to do here is so bizarre. Yeah, they they, they basically have to fawn over Jonah. And it was one of those things where, like, I, I get the joke. This is a, a a reference to how this is done. If you want to set up a character as a, a, a rebel, but someone with a heart of gold, you have people talk about them, and they reluctantly praise him. But one that doesn't fit Jonah in any way, because like his his personality is just kind of like bland guy, mm-hmm. and uh, like he doesn't he doesn't really do anything aside from like play with the drums and then answer a distress call like there's no I, again i get that it's a spoof of something but it, it doesn't actually like track with what's happening it's like they had the idea for the joke and then didn't really think that much about like executing it so it, it, it falls pretty flat and also i had no idea who aaron gray was Needed it high. <laughs> yeah so i just kind of assumed it's like oh this must be like the someone who got like handpicked from the kickstarter to be in the episode because i think that was one of the rewards <laughs> Is that you could have a walk on? I was like, oh, this nice lady must have donated like a thousand bucks or something. <laughs> okay, so it's referencing like a trope, but in doing so, it undermines its own story because if this is establishing that um, Gizmonic Institute is a thing and they're tracking Jonah, then why don't they go after him when they lose him? Yeah, and that's not even a thing that plays up later in the season either. Okay. I was wondering about that. So it just seems like what they were trying to do here uh, really fell apart. Luckily, this really shaky start doesn't doesn't doom the episode, but it, it was just a bad idea. I found it super distracting to go from one style where where it is shot almost like a like a film, albeit one with deliberately low tech effects, and then you know where it's after the credits. It's immediately two months later. It's like, hi, I'm Jonas. This is my robots on the satellite. I love. We changed Gypsy's voice. Anyway, invention exchange. <laughs> I'm like, what? And as as an old viewer, I can keep up to speed. Like I find it distracting, and I don't think it was well handled. But I can't imagine what a new person. This is why I would not pick this as a uh, intro episode for anyone to to watch for like people who are MST virgins because how how would you follow that like you would be so distracted that you don't you, you'd need to take a moment to get back into the episode. Are you an ant or a spider? I am neither. <laughs> I sorry. I'm a lobster. <laughs> There's something crawling on my floor. <laughs> Uh, going on, I will say one of the things I do like about the strange opening they have is, and they were smart to repeat it, is the introduction to Kinga, played by Felicia Day, which is excellent. Kinga comes out, she's on top of what looks like some kind of construction platform, and she's being wheeled out by a bunch of henchmen in bone outfits who are also parts of the band. 
and she sings a song about how she's recreating her ancestor's legacy and Felicia Day just nails it. Yeah, that's, oh man, I was so happy with the new version of the theme. And it was really unexpected, because like, one of the first things I saw on the MST3K Twitter was a uh, photo of Kate Micucci holding Tom Servo. And Kate is one half of Garfunkel and Oates. So (laughs) I kind of assumed, and this would have been a really obvious choice too, uh, and it would have been fine, is that the theme would have been done by... Garfunkel and Oates. Like, the most obvious things for, like, an MST3K that has, like, celebrities in it and is filmed in L.A. would be like, oh, it's Garfunkel and Oates do the theme, or Weird Al does the theme, or something. And the fact that it was, like, Harmar Superstar, who is not exactly, uh, like, at the forefront of anyone's mind, though I, I, I do really like him, but I I barely knew who he was, and, and most people I spoke to did, didn't really know who he was. That was an interesting choice, even though uh, Joel uh, kind of made fun of himself in a later interview. He's like, I promised that uh, I wouldn't have another doughy white guy perform the theme, and I'm sorry. <laughs> So because we're big MST3K nerds, I'm sure we could talk about the new version of the show endlessly, but perhaps we should move on to the movie. Or in this case, two movies? Yeah, we got multiple reptilicuses, or possibly reptilicai. I'm not sure how to pluralize that. Well, so we should clarify. We are watching the American version of this movie. Maybe you did. <laughs> but uh, Adam took the bullet for us all and watched the Danish version as well. Yeah, this is a lot like the Spanish Dracula. I don't know. Like, Are you familiar with that? Like the, the Dracula that they, they filmed at the same time they filmed the original Bela Lugosi Dracula? No, I did not know that. Okay, so Universal, knowing that they had, you know, a strong Spanish market uh, that was growing in the 1930s, thought... Oh hey, let's let's skip a step. Let's not dub over this movie. Let's have Todd Browning film the Bela Lugosi Dracula in the day, and then the Spanish crew with Spanish actors and the Spanish crew adapting the script, the same script, uh, are going to shoot their version at night. So that's how it worked. There was a night crew filming a uh, a, a version of the movie in a totally different language, hmm. and. The similar thing happened with Reptilicus. This is not like a dubbed version of the movie, nor is it the uh, nor is it the original cast speaking in English. Technically, uh, the movie was filmed twice. So there's two directors. There's a guy named Sid Pink who was uh, in charge of the American version, and Pool Bang, who uh, is a director of Dirk Passer comedies, which explains his prominence here, at least in the first half. Mm. Each directed their own version of the movie. So you have alternate takes. Of the exact same scenes in every single scene of this movie. There's like only the Reptilicus footage is really similar. And even that's been changed because watching the Danish version, uh, Reptilicus doesn't have uh, an acid goo sack. That was all added in (laughs) by the Americans who didn't think it was like gory or exciting enough. And similarly, the animated farmers, you know, that, that it struck me as so logical that that would be a thing that someone who's never made a monster movie it's like oh how do we show this puppet eating a guy (laughs) well instead of making a puppet guy we could just have like four frames of animation (laughs) which is probably the best visual in the entire movie uh going down (laughs) this puppet throat it's like no that was added in by americans you'll notice that all of the close-ups on reptilicus in the version that's featured on mst3k they're really, really scratchy and grainy in a way that the rest of the movie isn't. Mm-hmm. That's because, like, the Americans tinkered around with the footage. I see. Another thing that is worth noting is how this movie got promoted, both uh, in the States and in Denmark. Because the original poster, or sorry, the American poster, I should say, is just a, a, a standard shot where they localize the scene where um, Reptilicus approaches the bridge. But it's not like the Langebro Bridge. And Denmark, it's the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, as if to be like, this is American. Mm-hmm. Come see it. Go. Go see the Dragon movie, because it, it, it reflects your values, <laughs> I guess. But the Danish poster is something to behold. Yeah, it's wonderful. Reptilicus is purple he, on yeah, it. Yeah, he's Barney the Dinosaur with teeth. He's weirdly adorable. Do you want to reveal the Easter egg in that poster, Adam? Well, uh, the, the poster is full of a lot of jarring styles. So you've got Reptilicus, who is drawn in this purple cartoony way. Then you have these almost Terry Gilliam-style photorealistic illustrations of the actors in the movie on the right-hand corner. But on the bottom left, and you'll be able to see uh, this poster in the show notes on the bottom left there's a bunch of like cartoon characters who are supposed to represent the beach scene yeah 
but one of them appears to be a time-traveling Bob Denver in his Gilligan role because he is dressed exactly like Gilligan. The white hat, the red sweater. Was this was this like a fashion thing in the, the early 60s that nobody knew about? Maybe it was something that sailors wore? I don't know because the Gilligan's Island didn't come out for another two years, so... I have no idea where this look is coming from. If anyone out there has any information about why people were dressing like Bob Denver in the early 60s, please explain it to us. So when with the English version, almost all of the cast came back. There's one person who didn't speak a word of English, so she was replaced. Mm-hmm. But you, you had the cast uh, uh, speaking English. But, of course, because of their Scandinavian sing-song accents, the American distributors thought that this this is way too goofy. Now, the monster, he's perfect. <laughs> but but the, the, these accents, they just won't do. So everybody that, uh, everybody that you're seeing in the movie is dubbed. Like, did you notice any kind of, like, I don't know, weird disconnect between how they were talking and what they sounded like? Yes, to the point where it was exceedingly distracting for me with uh, General Grayson, who is the, you know, hard-headed American representation in this movie. And the actor playing him clearly knows English, like he's saying all the lines, but his his mouth doesn't move like an english speaker right his his mouth moves like someone who is making the words that they're supposed to make but it it's like if you actually want to make those noises that are being dubbed over that's not the way your mouth moves <laughs> so it almost would have been better if it had just been dubbed but it, just the contrast between uh what the mouth was mouthing (laughs) and what was coming out was just so distracting to me and it's funny because i I didn't notice it so much with the other characters i think maybe this guy was trying so hard to sound american that it really affected the way his face moved oh man that that would actually be really interesting to hear the original english audio track which of course has been lost to time uh that they recorded in their original scandinavian accents because it's very possible that he is like contorting uh, himself and like straining to sound more American. Or it's also possible that it's just an actor pretending to be a hard military guy. So perhaps his <laughs> face has to look tough as he's speaking. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of a, an unusual thing, but I don't know what, according to my notes, it appears that the actor who played general Grayson was not an actor at all, but one of the earliest Wita creations. So he's actually a prosthetic puppet. <laughs> Oh, that explains so much. Speaking of puppets, uh, you may notice that uh, if you watch the Danish version, that Reptilicus can fly, but only in one scene. I was going to ask, actually, because uh, you you showed some cuts uh, from the Danish version on Slack, Mm -hmm. and they were kind of beautiful. It was very much like, didn't have anything to do with like a kaiju movie at all. It was just like a love letter to Copenhagen. There's a great, like, swing kind of party going on where this uh, lady is singing this <laughs> uh, beautiful song in English about how great uh, the Danes are, basically. But um, it has nothing to do with the movie. So does that make it a more pleasant viewing experience to have all those distractions? Well, that version is in both both cuts. It's just cut from the MST3K version. Ah, uh, I see. The uh, Danish version runs like about 94 minutes. The American version runs 81 minutes. And, of course, all MST3K films are usually cut down to 79. So that is cut. There might be something else, but there are like a lot of extraneous scenes. That particular scene where there is a uh, chantreuse going on about lovely t- Tivoli nights mm-hmm. um, is is in both cuts, but it is slightly altered so that you could have a, a different actress because um, the person who plays Miss Miller, uh, who is the representative from uh, UNESCO, who joins uh, the Brigadier, but like doesn't actually really aff- affect the plot that much. Well, she um, she's the one who tells General Grayson to stop trying to blow the guy up once Professor Otto has his heart attack. Oh, that's right, yeah. And she's kind of set up as a love interest for General Grayson a little bit, but... Yeah, they go they go on a date. Uh, in, in the Tivoli scene, but that's it. Like, there's that never gets followed up on. It's uh, it's like when Dirk Passer disappears, but at least he goes out with a bang in the Danish version. Because right before you uh, you have the scene where uh, you know he's uh, being shocked by an electric eel <laughs> uh, and discovers that Reptilicus has come to life, he goes to a park 
And we're discovered that uh, uh, Pastor's character, uh, like Gamera, is beloved by children everywhere. I don't know why children will go up to, it's like, ah, it's the local dullard. Let's ask him about uh, what his job is. And if he's seen anything interesting, and he tells the children, hey, there's a big scary monster at the aquarium. Like, ah, you're full of it, Dirk Passer. You smell like herring. Get out of here. And he then proceeds to sing a jaunty song about how Reptilicus is really real, and it's super scary, and if you saw him, you would wet yourself. Um, and we're definitely putting this in the show notes because it is bizarrely wonderful or wonderfully bizarre. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, Dirk Passer, he is the biggest star in this movie, which is something the Mads established early on. He was probably the biggest star in Denmark at the time, period. Mm. And I have to say, he was my favorite part of the movie. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> He's great. Uh, like it's it. He's completely like tonally. What is he even doing there? Um, and in, in case you haven't seen this particular episode yet, he's basically a Jerry Lewis kind of figure. Very much a physical comedian to the point of being a little bit cartoonish. But he's also a very strong actor. And I think his strongest scenes are when he's just playing it a little bit cool because he's still a very magnetic presence. But um, he's also just a really good actor, and he can play subtle in a way that I found was very different from the rest of the actors who felt a little stiff, frankly. Yeah. No, I, I will say that like, I enjoyed uh, Dirk Passer when he was not goofing around yeah exactly like the the physical comedy stuff is very painful this is comedy with a capital <laughs> k it is so painful um and funnily enough even the scene where he is shocked by the electric eel is like a different longer version in the american cut for some reason <laughs> so i've been doing some research into dirk passer's career and it seems like for the most part what he was beloved for was that kind of very broad physical comedy there's the most popular one seems to be him playing a giant baby. <laughs> I can kind of see this because watching this would be like watching the original Godzilla that was recut for Americans. But instead of inserting Raymond Burr, they inserted Ernest P. Worrell. <laughs> hey, Vern, it's me, Ernest. I'm saying a prayer, a prayer for the entire world. Know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, he, he, he does not fit at all. And he feels at times like he's he's a tune from Who Framed Roger Rabbit being put into like the human world. I mean, when he was first introduced, before we even knew who Dirk Passer was, he walks in, he's, he's wearing overalls, and it, he just stands out so much between like these old guys and these super bottles as this slightly weird looking guy. And at first, he, like I said, he's a convincing actor. And so I almost feel like it was too bad that they had to make him do his shtick a little bit. Because it's, it's, yeah, you're right. It's not great. If you're not a fan of that kind of European style of Jerry Lewis, <laughs> you might not really gel to this very much. No. Uh, I, I did a little look, um, a look see into like his other vehicles. Because, yeah, like um, the director of the Danish version directed all of these passer comedies. And so he would have been like, he, he, he was still a big star at the time and was afterwards uh, from when Reptilicus came out. But like other other movies, I can only imagine what the films are like based on the poster thumbnails that I see on IMDb. Like there's one that's called Mig Og Mafiasen, which has uh, a bunch of characters running around and a giant Dirk Passer that has been like redesigned to look like uh, to look like Marilyn Monroe. Uh, <laughs> like doing the famous seven year itch thing. And I can only assume is that Dirk was uh, walking through the wilderness and saw two snakes copulating and he and he threw us threw a stick at it, but that angered a Greek god who turned him into a woman. <laughs> I have looked at a couple of the posters too. It seems like he's he was playing a lot of kind of Tyler Perry-ish kind of roles, like very much the broad, it's funny because I'm a lady, but I'm not kind of roles. 
Yeah, you mean like Medea's Christmas Carol and stuff? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Boo, a haunted house, a Medea vehicle? Yeah, you know, he's playing either, you know, a woman or a baby, and that's the joke, right? And there's this one musical called Stream and Carlson, where he just plays like a background guy in this in this musical, and he's great. Oh, really? So I can see why he was beloved. Like, he, he fit into what was considered funny at the time, but he was a very um, flexible star he could do a lot of things yeah like he's not conventionally attractive but he's he really just grabs your attention in whatever scene he's in he's a very magnetic presence i think you're absolutely right i think that he has a like undeniable charisma which is why he would have been such a big star that none of the other actors have literally none of them <laughs> like no one no one comes across well in this movie except for dirk and that sweet sweet reptilicus puppet and dirk was so, so popular that, like, this wasn't even going to be called Reptilicus initially? Like, wasn't this in production as Dirk and the Dragon? <laughs> yeah. Which is so funny because in the American version, at least, like, he's not there after the first half. So it would have made no no, no sense at all. I know. I had my fingers crossed that, like, oh, man, I hope in the Danish cut that Dirk ends up, like, swallowing some kind of formula, grows to giant size, and he submits... Reptilicus, like he's the one who wrestles Reptilicus into submission. <laughs> that would have been great. That would have been amazing. <laughs> but that's not what happened. The, the same thing occurs in the in the Danish version of the movie. Dirk's character disappears because he's no longer important to the plot, which, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense mechanically, but it's really weird and off-putting to spend all this time with a character who is super important in the first third, who just goes away unceremoniously like he died. <laughs> He got a hold of the police, and that was his job. The end. <laughs> so, I, if anything, I'm glad I watched this movie because I got introduced to a very interesting star from a, a from a different cultural background that I otherwise would not have known had existed. So, thank you, Reptilicus. Hey, everybody! It's time for the Shadow Thirteen. All right, you've heard the jingle. It is time for the Shallow 13. That's right, 13 fun facts about both this episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000 and the film Reptilicus. But the clock is ticking. We only have so much time before our shock collars go off, killing us instantly. Beth, go! Many Danish sources note that this is the first Danish science fiction movie that was filmed in color. A rather unremarkable achievement to claim, but there you have it. Speaking of which, the first Hollywood science fiction movie that was filmed in color looks to probably be Destination Moon, the arch-rival of Rocketship XM in 1950. The English version of this film was directed by Sid Pink, who gave us such films as The Angry Red Planet and The Man from Orgy. And yes, it's O-R-G-Y, like an acronym. I guess that's uh, I guess that's like The Man from Uncle, but with dongs out. Mm. One of the best characters in this movie, besides Dirk Passer, is Lisa Martens. And not because she's a good actor. It's entirely because of her outfits. Though apparently an adult woman, she dresses like, in the words of Crow, a giant doll lady robot. Her pink, frilly, Bo Peep outfits make no sense at all and are totally fun to look at. Reptilicus is not a cautionary tale of science gone mad like the brain that wouldn't die from Mike's first episode. Reptilicus's discovery causes rampant damage, but no one scolds Dr. Martens for tampering in God's domain. This episode begins Season 11's brief but bitter affair with Ib Melchior, who wrote and directed the experiment from Season 11, Episode 3, Time Travelers. Though primarily a science fiction writer, Melchior got his start in Hollywood directing episodes of a Perry Como variety show, which ran on TV from 1948 to 1967. Much of the film is set in Denmark's National Aquarium, but the building seen in the movie was torn down in 2012, presumably because, even after 50 years, the stink of Reptilicus still hadn't gone away. Like a lot of monster movies, Reptilicus serves as a kind of tourist brochure, showing off the attractions of wonderful Copenhagen. The final battle takes place in Copenhagen's City Hall Square, and in the last few scenes, you can see its iconic dragon fountain, featuring a dragon surprisingly similar to old Reptilicus. The writing credits is a real who's who of young creatives, including Community's Dan Harmon, Rick and Morty's Justin Roiland, and Patton Oswalt's brother, Matt Oswalt. Not to mention Flophouse Flopper and former Daily Show head writer, Elliot Kalin. The clone servo sketch recalls Justin Roiland's 2005 web series, House of Cosby's, in which a man clones a Cosby copia from a single Bill Cosby hair. The clones are weird in one note. The streaking butt-naked Cosby, blonde-haired Cosbyette, etc., and every tenth Cosby had a superpower. 
House of Cosby's was abruptly canceled when lawyers alleged it damaged Cosby's image. Let's have a moment of silence for deafening irony. The riff, Achem, Achem, is one of John Lovitz's many catchphrases on The Critic. See also, buy my book, Hush You, Hachi Machi, and Hi Guy. Remember how I noted that season one, episode one, The Crawling Eye, was filled with baby boomer references from the 50s to the 70s? Well, now we get references to Kickstarter, Twitter, and Adventure Time. It's a loud signal that this is not your leather daddy's MST3K. And that's time! I did a little digging. I have something exciting to show you. This is from from a little review of the novelization of Reptilicus. It's the sole one that is on Amazon from a Mark Baumgarten. And see, there's a few, few interesting little factoids. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you check out this particular section right here? Uh, okay. Uh, novelized by Dean Owen, also known as Dudley Dean McGoffey, and he lived from 1906 to 1986, who specialized in paperback westerns. Hmm. Uh, this is a god-awful novelization that will convince nobody to go out and check anything else Owen has written, or to start a movement to get somebody to reprint his past efforts. Ouch. Yeah, another excerpt from this one-star Amazon review. Then there is the sex here. I remember the movie, and we didn't have graphic for 1961 scenes of sex popping up constantly. Heavens no. You get the idea that most of these unpleasant people would sleep with their neighbor's dog if given the chance. But most of it here is just inappropriate. A monster attacks, so off come the clothes and babies are made. <laughs> It does seem a little bit <laughs> off tone. Ah, but this the, again, the review goes on, and, and in fact, they actually talk about some of the sex stuff. Oh, uh, should I read it? Yeah. All right. Hmm. A good example of just how unpleasant these characters are is when Karen seduces the man her sister Lisa has the hots for. She does this on Lisa's bed and leaves the after the deed mess for her sister to find and clean up while smirking the whole time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it sounds like it uh, takes a, a wild uh, t- turn from Reptilicus. But best of all, so this is one star review found on Amazon.com of the Reptilicus novelization. But the reviewer, who I guess is an expert on these things, uh, ends his review with this. For this site, I have also reviewed the following novelization. The Condemned, a WWE novel by Rob Hedden. The Frighteners, a novelization by Michael Jan. Juon by K. Ohishi. Juon 2 by Takashi Shimizu and Meimu. And Barb Wire, a novelization of the film of the same name by Neil Barrett Jr. Boy, I sure hope there's no extra sex scenes in the Barb Wire novelization. Well, maybe he is just a real stickler for whether it, it fits the mold or not. It's it's totally okay for Pamela Anderson's character to seduce a man on her sister's bed because that fits. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, reading this review, I was extremely tempted to seek the novelization out for myself oh, okay uh-huh and i and i, and I have some things because like it's it's pretty steamy stuff it's very steamy uh i've actually got got a few excerpts here all right yeah yeah, yeah. and uh because i acquired it on ebay and and I, sure enough you know there are a few liberties I, I think the overall story is the same but there are a few liberties here and there. Nice character moments. Uh, okay, so I, I've sent you a PDF. I've transcribed it day and night for the last two days. I finally got it, and it should be in your, your, your Slack now. So follow along with me. Turn to page 15 and listen to this. All right, here I go. <clears throat> Back at the aquarium, Brigadier General Grayson was unsatisfied with his date with Miss Miller. A fine woman with simple tastes. Too simple, he thought, as he suddenly noticed Dr. Martins reading some papers. Grayson froze in his steps, but it wasn't a military fanfare that brought this brig to stand at attention. No, this was the call of a bugle of a different sort. The scientist's face was pale and his hair was colorful and wild. Dr. Martins had the look of a big, sexy clown. I must have him, Grayson thought, as he walked over to his new object of affection. The brig approached Martins and placed his hands on the old man's heaving bosom. Martins wasn't shocked. It was only a matter of time before my pansexual magnetism reached you, Brigadier, he said. I've never felt this way about a man before, Dr. Martins. Dr. Martins' brow was half-cocked and so was the Brigadier. (laughs) You're in a different land, Brigadier, the old man said. You're here in Denmark as a sensual tourist. Be my tour guide, the Brigadier rasped. 
We've woken one sleeping dragon today, Dr. Martin said as he removed the brig's hat. Martin's lips, big, dry, and flaky like a stale croissant, pressed up to the brigadier's right ear and whispered, What's the harm in waking a second one? The younger man tore open Martin's shirt. The old man's flesh broke free and flooded him. It was like a dam burst, but the dam was Martin's shirt, and the sea was a lake of adipose. Oh, boy. Ooh, that's sexy. Look at that. All right. All right. I, I got to check this out now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, t- t- I want you to, to turn your attention to a later chapter. All right. Let's see what you've... Oh, boy. Okay. Chapter two. All snizzle. All <laughs> snizzle. <laughs> this was ghost written by Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Chapter 2. All sizzle, all snake. Reptilicus had many enemies. Guns, being frozen, humans who don't turn into cartoons before you eat them. Yet the greatest nemesis of his winged snake beast was a lonely heart. Sure, it enjoyed many a hot makeout party with other reptilici, but it wasn't the same. It felt empty to score with a giant snake monster that had grown from a part of your body that was shot off by the Danish military. Somehow it seemed so masturbatory. Reptilicus was as sad as a 50-ton snake with an acidic venom stack could ever be. Or at least it was until it spotted eyes on her. Reptilicus hadn't been alive long, but it knew what it liked, and it liked her. She was long, she was lean, and she was held by a number of suspension cables. Yes, this thing the humans called the Langabro Bridge would be its mate. Was it a her? Who cares? Reptilicus wrapped its body around the yielding concrete and began its mating wriggle. Reptilicus's whole body was on fire, but not like when the military used their flamethrowers. This was a soothing fire that was growing into something. Reptilicus only heard its snake buddies talk about it in the old country. Reptilicus wrapped its body across the bridge, breaking each cable until both the bridge and the creature fell into the waters below. Wow. This is hot stuff. Oh. <laughs> okay, so the whole point of this novel was just to make everything about sexy times. Like, everything. As far as I can tell, there is a sex scene every three pages. New characters are introduced. Uh, every character has a sex scene, except for Dirk Passer, who takes off his overalls and reveals himself to be an asexual angel figure with no genitals, which is why he disappears halfway through. <laughs> he ascends to the heavens, having done his work. Something I also wanted to bring up, which I, I'm thinking might be a trend going forward, is the prominence of America in foreign films. So we already saw this with The Crawling Eye, with Forrest Tucker, who comes into Switzerland to figure out what's happening on top of a mountain, because if you're having trouble, you got to call in an American. And we're getting the same thing here, basically. Like, there's this crisis that the Danes themselves are ill-equipped to handle, so they call in an American general. And this is really fascinating because all of these are, are, of course, these are movies that are happening during the Cold War. So I wonder if if some of this is some political alignment going on. I think there's two things going on here. Number one, it's commercial, right? If you want to get your move your movie in America, then you have to have a prominent American in it. And in order to really appeal to Americans, that American has to be a kick-ass, take names kind of leader dude. <laughs> <laughs> And there's also a political situation going on where you're having the world kind of going, kind of splitting into Cold War factions. And so there's also an underlining sense of like, we are, as the West, a united military force. And if there's any trouble, we will all band together. And of course, the Americans will be in charge because we need this. We need the Americans to be in charge because the Soviets are so big and scary. Too scary for Denmark. <laughs> and and well, it's, it's weird. They do uh, big up the Americans. And I thought perhaps that would be just for the American cut. Like I was half convinced that General Grayson in the Danish version of the movie would turn out to be just, you know, part of the Danish military. <laughs> um, he's still American. But, uh, yeah, the weird thing is um, the Miss Miller character, who also comes from UNESCO, uh, about, like, 20, 30 minutes into the movie, is a different character depending on which version you see. So in the American version of the movie, she's an American, too. So that's what you see in the MST3K episode. And he's, like, relieved. Ah, ah, an American. But in the Danish version of the movie, 
Uh, she she's just given herself an American name, and she is also from Denmark. And Grayson is like, ah, oh, pity. And he, he's enraged that he is just surrounded by Danes everywhere. Then he remarks that the reason he speaks uh, uh, the reason he speaks the language so well is that his mother was Danish, and he's ashamed of that. Oh, interesting. But that's in the Danish version of the movie. Like, they're, they're, they're kind of crapping on themselves in their own country, even though 10 minutes from now, those two characters are going to go on a date while a singer goes on about wonderful Tivoli. Well, I think that might be the point, right? It might be a sense that uh, they're playing out in this interpersonal relationship what they hope happens with America, right? Like, they're feeling slighted by America. America doesn't appreciate them. And then the Americans get seduced by Tivoli and the and that bridge. <laughs> and... <laughs> And they fall in love. To all of our American listeners, do you have a hate in your heart for Denmark? Please write in. (laughs) So I think this will be interesting to uh, keep an eye out for going forward with uh, subsequent foreign films. Because I seem to recall that Gamera has some awkward American insertions as well. Hmm. Is this just something you have to do if uh, English-speaking audience is going to look at it at all. Well, it's interesting that you mention that because uh, Gamera's more famous rival, Godzilla. The Godzilla series is fairly famous that I'd say, I don't know, about 80% of Godzilla movies are full of rampant anti-American sentiment. <laughs> and given that that's, that series' origins, that makes total sense. I think it's about time we wrapped up our Origins trilogy by thinking about the hosts that could have been. Yeah. Now, during the time that uh, MST3K was off the air, or maybe even like while it was on and, you know, Mike had done it for a while, so you were thinking maybe he would transition out of it. Did you ever give any thoughts to like who would make a good host for the show? Well, when they first announced that they were reviving MST3K for Netflix, and early on it got out that Elliot Kalin was connected to the new series. Mm Mm-hmm. I was thinking that Ellie Kalen would be the new host. And I thought that made perfect sense because not only is he vocally dexterous, he's very funny, but he already comes in with like a pre-programmed personality. You know, you have laid back, slightly stonerish Joel, you have passive aggressive Midwesterner Mike, and then you have the brainy smurf know-it-all who has all these obscure facts, you know? Yeah, that's true. I mean, like that made him an ideal head writer. And I was thinking that watching him in uh, his occasional appearances in the host segments, just how much personality he gives off in a one-off role, mm-hmm. uh, which he gets to do a couple of times. It's funny that you mention uh, Elliot, because I remember when I started listening to The Flop House, I was like, you know who would make a great host for a new season would be uh, Stu, the Stu Man Wellington. <laughs> he would also be great. <laughs> yeah, he'd be a laid-back party dude, which has also never been on the satellite of love. And Stuart, like, for those who don't listen to The Flop House, Stuart's the only one who is not a professional comedy writer, but is probably the flapper who makes me consistently laugh the most he is just naturally funny yeah it's it's something that you can't train or bottle he just is yeah he's very charismatic too um yeah and easy on the eyes anyway (laughs) uh one person who i totally thought would make a great host and then frank sang her praises as uh as like a fellow stand-up and someone that he worked with a bunch uh on stand-up gigs that i think would make actually a terrific mst3k host although she's probably too big for it now Maria Bamford. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. She was always kind of like my, you know, unless unless like Stu won the lottery or was like pulled off, <laughs> pulled onto uh, the stage like Courtney Cox at that Bruce Springsteen concert <laughs> into into endless fame on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Uh, I thought she would be perfect because like she lends herself so naturally to doing voices, which is exactly what you'd want in the theater. Right. You'd have someone who is just as wacky as, as the bots because I know that whenever I brought up the topic of having a, uh, a lady hosting the show, a lot of people were hesitant just because, oh, well, if she's going to be around the bots, that would naturally make her the scold. Mm. But I, I don't think that would happen, especially with a, uh, with a performer like Maria. Who is uh, like again? If you have Netflix, and if you're listening to this, you probably do. <laughs> it's it's well worth checking out. She has an amazing show called Lady Dynamite, which is a better Arrested Development than Arrested Development season four ever was, or even the original Arrested Development. Yeah, I would argue yeah. those those middle two seasons are great, but otherwise, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's some filler there that people don't like to acknowledge. <laughs> And she has some amazing stand-up uh, uh, specials that are also, I think, mostly on Netflix. And 
she has a really off kilter uh, personality. She can kind of do anything. Uh, again, Adventure Time fans will recognize her from a bunch of different princesses and one off roles that she does. And like, there's a real darkness uh, uh, to her comedy where she frequently talks about her battles with depression and other psychiatric ailments. So she'd be able to like really wring a lot of jokes out of darker material, but still, I think, retain the kind of sweetness necessary for Mystery Science Theater 3000's tone. You know? Yeah, that's a fantastic choice. That's what I do, but I don't. I don't. I'm not in charge of the show. <laughs> But Joel is, and you know who who Joel's original choice to replace him was, right? I did not know this until you informed me, and I find it fascinating. Yeah, because he did want A. Nelson to replace him, but he specifically wanted Bridget Nelson, or Bridget Jones, as she's usually credited, I think, in like the early seasons. For those who might not immediately uh, have a face to that name, she's probably best known for playing Nuvina, Woman of the Future. (laughs) Or Mr. B. Natural. Or Mr. B. Natural. And uh, Joel, in an interview, referenced that because she had this kind of high energy to her performances, like she was the natural follow up because, you know, there wasn't he he felt that there wasn't much difference between uh, him and Mike because they're both, you know, white, doughy Midwestern guys who are not exactly fast talkers. Mm -hmm. And what I find kind of interesting about that is, you know, you talk to fans And they notice a huge difference between Mike and Joel and their respective (laughs) deliveries. But I think that's an interesting uh, point that he'd want to go for someone who is the opposite. But the interesting thing about his idea for the replacement is that Joel wanted Bridget to play Joel. Um, what? (laughs) The story is as follows. So Joel's half-baked idea was this. So around uh, around Mitchell, around 512, his last appearance on the show, the satellite of love would be hit by what he called a sex ray, <laughs> and Joel would immediately change genders. Mm. But because it's Joel, he'd be cool with it, and that would be the last segment of 512, I assume, and then we'd open with Bridget as Joel, and I guess she would develop her personality uh, as being different from her counterpart uh, uh, as the seasons went on. But yeah, she would just be like, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a girl now. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> that was his idea, was that the character would stay the same, but the body would change. How would you have reacted to that if that had happened? In the 90s? I don't think I would have liked it, frankly. I would just be like, that seems weird. <laughs> like the fact that uh, you're making it about the sex change, but that that's then we're just supposed to accept it? I, I don't know. I think it would have been an awkward fit, frankly. It would have been a strange thing to expect your audience to go along with for another three seasons, you know? Yeah. I think the whole time they would have it would have been like when they uh, switched dogs on Family Guy and there was like a huge <laughs> outcry. Wait, I don't follow Family Guy. Well hop on? Brian was killed and replaced with another dog for a while whose name I forget. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like it was a winning choice. <laughs> and uh, the fan base just went nuts because it wasn't clear whether this was just the new normal or not. And they were not accepting that. And so eventually, uh, whether planned or because of the audience response, I believe, uh, Brian was brought back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, it would have felt like a kooky setup that wasn't supposed to last more than a couple seasons and i think you would have gotten that resistance as a result had they simply just like had the plan been and 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 who knows if they took joel up on his idea of having bridget be his replacement chances are they would have been like well you've got a good idea and a bad idea and we're gonna throw (laughs) the bad idea away exactly i think bridget jones replacement if it would just be like here's your new host would have been a better fit than now this is joel as a as a lady yeah because i think that would have brought like a lot of baggage it would have left a shadow of joel that would have like hurt the show and like people would be weirded out because they'd always remember it's like remember how she's she's not actually a new character like remember that's just like joel had a forcible sex change would they just keep calling her joel like yeah her character's uh, name would be joel even though like she is a very different personality from joel like nothing would have lined up yeah but that that was that was Joel's idea, which is like uh, again a mix of a really good idea and a really yeah. dumb idea. <laughs> I don't think there would have been too much of an objection to Bridget again had she just come on as yeah. Bridget had she been like her own character. But like 
<laughs> I think I think whenever your plot has a sex ray in it, it's a bad idea. <laughs> that said, when your show's been off the air for almost 20 years, maybe you can be a little bit more bold about your choice of host instead of going with another white guy. Yeah, I was I was a little disappointed that we went from a doughy Midwestern guy to a doughy Midwestern guy to a doughy Hawaiian guy. And again, like he he does he does a fine job, but at, at this point, it would have been interesting to see the dynamic of the bots with a different kind of person, a different kind of human from what we've seen. Yeah, and and so far, what we've mostly have for Jonah's personality, as a, a listener Nicole from Newfoundland wrote in, is that you know he just has a bizarre fixation on woodcuts. <laughs> Good one. Well, I think that just about wraps up all the time we have to discuss Reptilicus today. But uh, I have to peer in to our uh, production booth way atop Mount Olympus. Chris, did we get any letters from listeners today? We sure did. Uh, longtime listener Charlotte from Portland asks, Which host would win the Great Misty Bake Off and what would his signature dish be? Beth, do you have any ideas? <sighs> I think Joel would be the best baker. Because he's already baked. Whoa, boom, <laughs> 420. Uh, he just, he's such a wholesome fellow, and he comes from about as Midwest as you can get. I feel like he'd know his way around an, an apple pie, you know? <laughs> he, he would know how to make a really good, really classic apple pie that you'd see at your, at your local fair. Hmm. I feel like Mike is more of a cook. He would be really good at making a Thanksgiving dinner. He could do stuffing and potatoes. Whoa. As a multitasker. Well, I, I, I would agree. I would say that your remarks on both hosts would certainly make sense. I know that someone involved in the show whose cooking show I would absolutely love to see, uh, and it would be TV's Frank Connor. <laughs> because I have a feeling that it would be almost exactly like Weber Cooks. Have you ever seen that? No. What's that? Okay. So Weber Cooks, and there'll be a link to this in our show notes. Uh, Weber Cooks is a cable access series that is being uploaded to YouTube I think just out of the sheer strangeness of it, in which a man name his name isn't even Weber. He's like, I'm Stephen Groff, and, and this is Weber Cooks with me, Stephen Groff. <laughs> but he is an elderly gentleman who uh, uh, has recipes like this. Spaghetti. <laughs> what you do is you, you put the noodles in, in water, and then you microwave for about 10 minutes. Then you open your can of pasta, drain the spaghetti, Add the sauce, put it in the microwave with the sauce now for about five minutes. And now you have spaghetti. Costs about a buck. And I have a feeling that that's exactly what Frank Conniff's uh, cooking show would be. Because he wouldn't be cooking that much. He'd be too busy tweeting. <laughs> well, I, I give him more credit than that. I feel like Frank has kind of a Julia Child vibe to him. He's certainly as lovable as Julia Child. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you're all snizzle, all snake, or if you'd like to ask Beth and Adam a random off-topic question, get in touch with us. Email us at info at itsjustashow.com, visit our website at itsjustashow.com, or we're on Twitter at it is just a show. We'd love to hear from you. You can support It's Just a Show and access some super fan bonus bits by going to itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash it's just a show. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned on It's Just a Show, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 10. Okay, that wraps it up for our Origins trilogy. So as many of you know, Mystery Science Theater is currently on tour doing a bunch of live movie riffing. Tickets are still available in a handful of cities, none of which are near us. So we're going to have to watch the movie they're doing without them. It's season five, episode six, Ega! Yay! Do you remember this episode, Beth? For some reason, it did not make it into my keep this tape forever pile. But I do remember it fondly for Arch Hall Jr. And I'm looking forward to seeing him again. Yeah, this is one of my absolute favorite episodes. And it did make it into my pile because it's one of the first Rhino tapes I bought. So good. It'll be nice to see something that we know is good. Yeah, and also uh, R.I.P. Richard Q. He's in heaven with the Giants now. Did he just die? No. <laughs> 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 all right well until next time thanks for joining us for our origins trilogy hope you keep listening we did it take it away theme squad Bye.
Ryan.